I'm starting this to the second on time. Three, two, one. All right, 7 p.m. Hello, everybody. Hello. How's everybody doing? Good. 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 So I'm, I'm from the other side of the country, the left coast. Left coast. Uh, Vancouver is home. Um, my job for Nikon is BC Territory Manager and Nikon Professional Services Rep. So I sell stuff to stores, I support photographers from news organizations to law enforcement, federal government, um, all sorts of institutions. So my job is to kind of know a whole bunch about Nikon gear and uh, kind of what I want to cover tonight. Uh, two years ago, uh, I was fortunate enough to be in that uh, one of the early people to get my hands on a D850 and I thought, wow, this is the greatest thing Nikon has ever done. And I still maintain that the D850 is one of the greatest cameras Nikon's ever made. And so over the course of that year, I shot the D850 for absolutely everything. I took it out, shot wildlife, pro sports, studio portraits, family snapshots of my kids. I shot the D850 for absolutely everything. Then last August, I get this like mystery email. Come on in, you're good. Sorry, Come, no, you're good, man. I get this mystery email that I'm going somewhere and like pack a bag, you're going to this event. And so we fly to New York and I get this mirrorless camera put in my hand, I get this Z7 put in my hands and I'm like, okay, this is kind of cool. And so I spent the last year basically shooting nothing but mirrorless cameras. And I discovered some things I love about them and I discovered some things that I've now grown to love about them and I've also discovered some things that maybe I've had to work around. But I haven't touched or shot seriously my D850 since about a week after I got my sample of the Z7. And I just personally invested in uh, Z6 finally for my own purposes to shoot because 46 megapixel files chew up a lot of space on a computer. And 24 tends to be enough. So what we're gonna talk about today though, um, I'm fortunate where I live out there on the left coast, we are surrounded by humongous amounts of wildlife of all sorts. I do a lot of action shooting and a lot of wildlife shooting. And we're gonna talk about sort of a comparison between using a DSLR to shoot these subjects and using a mirrorless camera to shoot these subjects. And the difference is a lot smaller than you might think. Um, there are lots of advantages to both and I wanna get into sort of what those are. So let's talk about a couple things. Like number one, actually getting to the shot. So you're packing your bag, you're taking your gear. So a shade over a year ago, I had a little guy. So anytime I go out to shoot pictures, I have 20 pounds of baby strapped to my chest. So the last thing on earth I need now is 40 pounds of camera gear strapped to my back. A lot of the places I go to make pictures, it's a fair walk to get there. So the first thing I'm interested in is making sure that I've actually cut a bit of the weight out of my gear. And that's where mirrorless can really, really help. Um, so packing my bag, super important. But we're gonna talk about, like I said, two main categories. First and foremost, yeah, he's showing me his tooth. He's the tried and trusted Nikon DSLR. He's not gonna eat me. There, there's an electric fence between me and that bear, just for full disclosure. Um, the newcomer to the market, for us anyways, is Nikon mirrorless cameras. That's a Sandhill crane that shot at 24 millimeter on a full frame camera. They came to me and I was just like, whoa, what a shot, crouched down and sat there and just ripped a bunch of frames. And this is on a Z6. One other thing I will mention before we keep going. Um, most of the DSLR pictures that you'll see that will come up tonight went through Lightroom or Photoshop. Anything from a mirrorless camera was directly raw processed in camera, snap bridge to my phone, airdrop to my Mac, dropped into this presentation. So nothing you see has been through any sort of computer post-processing at all. This is all basically raw conversion straight out of camera to JPEG. So this is a JPEG conversion of the raw file. But when we're talking about shooting an action or a wildlife subject, I mean, we gotta get a few settings done on the camera. And that doesn't matter whether it's DSLR or mirrorless. There are some fundamentals in setting up your camera that you just, you have to do. Um, exposure modes, uh, all sorts of different things. So let's talk about just doing the camera setup. So some of the DSLRs have like the various mode buttons. Some of them have what I call the PASM dial. And the new Z series, they have the, uh, Manual, aperture, shutter, program, green square mode, U1, 2, and 3, which I'll get into in a little bit because they're the greatest thing ever on these cameras. But essentially, this is where you get started, your exposure modes. Now, there's a few different modes that are common to all the cameras. Of course, full auto, 
program auto, which gives you a little bit of control, aperture or shutter priority mode, and of course full manual. And I have one rule when I'm shooting any kind of action and moving subject, and that rule is never, ever, 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 did I say ever enough? Ever use auto. Auto gives you no control over the camera whatsoever. You will get a great snapshot, but had I shot this frame in auto, you would have seen the background behind him. It, it, I couldn't have made the creative decision that I made to make sure that bear was isolated. I was also laying down in a mud puddle to get this shot, but that's okay, I got the shot. Um, that's the same guy that you saw before that was showing me his tooth. Um, so that's, that's all fine and good. Like, I think when you're actually getting into it, probably if you're not sure and you need to use some sort of semi-automatic mode to shoot like a wildlife or an action subject, probably shutter priority would be your best bet. At least then you know you can set a shutter speed that's gonna allow you to freeze the action in front of you and let the camera make some of the other decisions for you. But there's a red line through auto for a reason because I never want you in auto when shooting this subject matter. Okay, so DSLR, autofocus modes. So AFS, obviously autofocus single, AFC, autofocus continuous, or AFA, which is autofocus automatic. Um, that red line that went through auto, I'm gonna put a red line through this auto as well. AFA is great for a convenience uh, when you're just taking like a general snapshot, but in terms of a subject like this, what the camera's actually doing is going, is my subject still or is my subject moving? So you have this nice still bird and he's sitting on a post and you're getting ready to take a picture of him and he takes off. So AFA, the camera goes, oh man, that thing moved. I better switch to AFC. But by the time the camera makes the switch, sometimes your subject is too far gone. So I don't always recommend AFA in that you're giving up just a little bit too much control to your camera and it can't react at the speed you need it to react. This particular blue heron, I literally almost stepped on. I walked down into, we have this birding area near my place and I walked down in to see if I could see around the corner and he was right there and he flew away. Had I been in AFA, there is no way I would have gotten this shot. It's raining like crazy as you can see the raindrops right there. This is a D850 and the ISO is all the way up at 8,000 to get this shot. Like the light was not good but I was still out there birding because that's what I do. Now in a mirrorless camera, there's two main modes. There's AFS, autofocus single, or AFC, and there's various sub-modes underneath those modes. And you'll see later, I have a rule, and I'm never, almost never in AFS, regardless of the subject matter that I shoot. I live my life in autofocus continuous. Now for DSLR, various autofocus systems. One thing I should be totally clear on, from D30, D3000 series up to D5 and all the way through, every one of our DSLRs is capable of 3D tracking a subject through the frame. The difference between the various cameras is the amount of autofocus points that you get and the coverage that each of those autofocus points provide. So a 3000 series, you have 11 points of autofocus. You can still 3D track a subject with 11 points of autofocus. On a 5000 series, 39 points. You have a better chance of 3D tracking. 51 was our flagship not that long ago. And of course now with the D500, D850, and D5, you have 153 points of autofocus. Great to have. On the D500, it covers almost the entire frame, which allows your subject to go anywhere. Now in mirrorless, I had to update this slide not long ago for the Z50. So 493 points of focus on the Z7, Z7, 273 on the Z6, and 209 on the new Z50. Um, what does that mean? Well, that means we have 90% coverage. There's literally just a little narrow band around the edge of the frame where you actually don't get autofocus. And I think if you're putting your subject in that band, they're pretty much out of frame anyways, so you should be able to sort of keep them inside there. Um, face and now with the new firmware, obviously eye detection autofocus. At this point, I've only recognized a couple of animals that it actually works on. It doesn't work all the time, but people, it's absolutely great for, as you'll see a little bit later. And then predictive autofocus technology. So in an auto area AF mode, it's actually able to kind of separate your subject from your background. You'll see an example and actually do a really good job in auto area autofocus, picking your subject out and focusing on it for you. Um, we also take a bit of a hybrid approach to our autofocus on the mirrorless cameras. Um, 
phase detect autofocus. So it actually uses the autofocus sensors on the sensor and it racks to the point of focus and stops right there. And the cool thing about the Z-series is it does a tiny little really fast additional contrast detect confirmation step to really make sure that it's locked that focus in. So when it hits, I mean it hits. It is pin sharp and it hits. And you don't get any delay with that little step. It's just doing a tiny little bit just to make sure that it absolutely nails the focus. So lots of different autofocus modes within AFS and AFC, right? So the first mode that I think a lot of us try to use right away because it's familiar, it's comfortable, we like to try to use it, is single point autofocus. So bathing bear, six o'clock in the morning, you can see the mosquitoes, I'll tell you they were munching on me and the bear, I didn't stay for that long. Um, but put that single point on the bear's eye, get a great shot of an early morning bathing bear. Um, so that's great for that. Or how about a short-eared owl defending its kill? Now, just out of frame above it is a northern harrier swooping at it, trying to take its lunch. So it makes itself look really big to keep the harrier away. Um, about eight frames after this, I got a picture of it popping the head off the vole that it caught. And I don't often show that in these type of presentations because some people get offended. And that's okay. Um, so I put some red in the frame anyways, but that's more to demonstrate the autofocus point where I had it on his eye. He stayed on that post a while, so I was able to maintain single point autofocus. Slower moving subjects, no problem at all. Uh, Canadian Forces Cormorant Rescue Chopper. Where did I put the autofocus point? Well, the autofocus point was on the nose of the chopper. And for subjects like this, single point is awesome. It's a great way to focus. What you want to do is just kind of know that your subject's a bit of a slower moving subject. Now what happens when your subject starts moving more quickly and you're in single point autofocus? Well, there's a nice golden eagle flying away and we put the point on him. The problem is as soon as he moves, it looks kind of more like a B2 bomber taking off in the background as opposed to a bird flying at your camera. Single point's not that good for quickly moving subjects because you have to keep that point racked right on your subject. If it drifts off your subject at all, focus is lost. So for anything moving, I say don't ever use a single point autofocus. The mode that I am in most times on both DSLR and mirrorless is one of our group modes. So when you look on say like a D850, that's what group autofocus looks like in your viewfinder. Obviously there would be something behind that unless it's like a white cat in a snowstorm. But these four points plus all the points inside it conspire to create one huge autofocus point. And what the camera does is it looks for the object of highest contrast inside those points, and that's what it racks focus on. So if, you, if you're in continuous, you just need to keep that diamond on your subject as it goes through the frame, and it'll rack nice critical focus on your subject for you. And you can move that group around to change your composition, which is really, really nice. So a couple of examples of using group. Um, this is up at Pitt Lake, just outside Vancouver, uh, right at the end of the boat launch was an osprey's nest. And believe me when I say there is a lot of photographers at this spot because this is shot with a 70-200 at 70 millimeter. That's how close you can get to them. And I'm in a lineup of about 60 different photographers taking shots of this guy. Um, there's a bald eagle across the lake, so mom and dad were taking turns. They wouldn't both leave the nest because that eagle would come down and take the babies. So it was just watching them swap. They'd go fishing, grab a fish, come back, feed the chicks, the other one would take off. And you sat there for hours and just watched this happen. But group autofocus, it just grabbed focus on the bird. I'm probably stopped down to about f5.6 to make sure I get good front back focus on the bird. And that's mom, headed off to go uh, grab a fish. The Abbotsford International Air Show a couple years ago, my absolute favorite aircraft on earth. Lock that diamond somewhere on the plane and get a nice in focus shot. This is with a D850 and an 800 millimeter 5.6, which I'd never shot before that day. And when somebody else didn't have it, I was totally geeking out and grabbing the 800 and making a few frames, cause well, I'm like that. That's what I do. Yeah. Or shooting pro soccer. Group is a great mode for shooting pro soccer. I understand there might be a lot of TFC fans here. That's absolutely fine. I'm a Whitecaps guy. I'm from Vancouver. I spent a lot of time on the sidelines and I'm most guilty of when I'm at these games and I'm supposed to be making pictures of actually watching the game sideline. And I get pretty distracted and I watch 15 minutes of soccer. Then I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to be shooting. I go ahead and I take shots again. But uh, yeah, they, they lost. They often do. That's okay. Now in terms of mirrorless, 
there's a couple <laughs> variants of the sort of group autofocus mode, and I've come to really, really appreciate what they are and what they, in fact, can do. Um, so there's AF area wide S. So AF area wide small. And essentially, that's a square version of what that diamond is on the SLR. And it looks for the highest point of contrast in the frame, in this case, it's the bighorn sheep's nose. That's what it chose to rack focus on. I'm shooting with the 500 millimeter, 5.6 PF, the F to Z adapter on a Z6 mirrorless camera, shooting this one. I used actually the built-in carbon picture style to shoot it in black and white. So I'm looking through my electronic viewfinder and I'm seeing the image monochrome and I'm loving it. I'm also shooting raw, so I have a full color image to play with later as well. But this is the straight out of camera JPEG using the carbon picture style on the Z series, and I love that picture style. Another case where I'm sitting there watching the action instead of photographing the action. So that short-eared owl, this is a different one than before. Might even be the same guy, but this is a year and a half later. So he had gone and hunted and killed himself a tasty bull for lunch, and he's flying around, and this northern harrier is doing everything in his power to harass this owl and take his lunch away. Now the amazing thing to me was, one, that I watched this battle go on forever, two, I completely forgot to take pictures for a while. But three, when I remembered, oh man, I gotta take pictures, A, I was in the right autofocus mode, so AF area wide large. So it turns that little square into a bigger rectangle and uses all the points within there. But B, this is a Z or a Z6 with a 200 to 500 millimeter F mount lens on it with a two times teleconverter. So I'm at a thousand millimeter F11 and I'm racking meaningful autofocus on a moving subject in good light. And <laughs> on an SLR, I, I would have seen the hunt. I would never have gotten these shots. And I was spending so much time watching the show and then it was like, oh man, make a frame. So I went ahead and I made a frame. And they fought for a while. The short-eared owl ended up going to ground to have his lunch. And I have a picture, which again, I don't show in these presents of the harrier. They call him a harrier because they hover. And he came down and he hovered above the owl and he pooped on the owl as he was eating his lunch. That's pretty rude. All right, and then a little waterfowl. Um, you know, I probably could have used a different autofocus mode here, but I happen to be in air, AF area wide, wide large. And this is a 200 to 500, and I'm using the articulating screen on the, on the Z6 so I can have the camera nice and down low. And I use the touch screen to touch focus and touch take the image. Come on in. No, no problem at all. To touch the focus and actually take the image um, as that happens. So, that's sort of the, the mirrorless version of group autofocus on a DSLR, and I've come to really, really appreciate what it actually can do. Um, you'll find if you were to grab any of the, the Z-series cameras that I have and you were to pick them up and turn them on, you would probably find that it would be in one of those two AF area wide, small or large modes, because that's where I almost always am. Um, Another one that I don't use as often but can come very much in handy is dynamic area autofocus. Um, you're going to notice a running theme through this is I shoot the 200 to 500 a lot. I really, really, really love that lens. Um, this is mounted on a Z7 with the F to Z adapter. And so the dynamic autofocus, that's the main point of autofocus. And if your subject drifts off that main point, it uses surrounding points as helper points. So it says, okay, this is what you initially focused on, but you drank too much coffee today, you're a little bit shaky, and your camera moved to the right, so it's on those left points, so I'm gonna use that point to help you keep focused on your subject. So it's a variant on that group autofocus mode. And I find it to work really, really well. The 200 to 500, by the way, is an awesome macro lens. You just gotta get a fair ways away from your subject and rack it out to 500 millimeter. But he was doing his thing, eating some nectar, was happy to do it. Now, one thing I love about DSLRs, probably my favorite autofocus mode in the history of Nikon is 3D tracking. Um, you're looking at sort of the viewfinder view of our D500, so our flagship DX DSLR. Um, that's kind of what all the points would look like on a D500. Now using 3D tracking on a D500 is an absolute revelation and the first time I used it I was blown away by what it was able to do. I'm going to play it a little example for you here and I'm going to play it a couple times so I can demonstrate what 3D tracking actually does. So this is actually in Whistler, British Columbia. It's kind of a blurry mess right now but all shall be revealed. So as he pops over the top you see that point following him. 
and you're blasting away at 10 frames a second and that point's just following your subject as he goes through the frame. Allow me to play that again for you. You don't want to see the rig that was used to make that video through the viewfinder of a D500. You don't want to know. It took some engineering smarts to get that done. But that really clearly demonstrates how well 3D tracking actually works on a D500. D5, D850 also features 3D tracking. So remember I told you I spent a lot of time at Whitecaps games. This is no different. This is, uh, this is one of my favorite Whitecaps players. He's a rocket ship. He runs fast. And this is using 3D tracking. And basically, I lock the point on the Bell logo on the front of his jersey. And at 12 frames a second on a D5, just stayed mashed on the shutter button while he ran upfield. And what I really like about this is he's not coming directly towards me. He's not going directly across. He's actually going in a diagonal direction of travel, which really is not the easiest thing on earth for 3D tracking to be able to do, but absolutely no trouble doing it here. And I just took a bunch of still frames and, learned, and Googled how to make a GIF in Photoshop, and it led me to this. So turned out not bad. Nice little loop. Now, on a mirrorless camera, we don't have exactly the same mode of 3D tracking. We have auto area AF and we have subject tracking. I'm a little divided. Um, I found for the purposes of this type of photography, I infinitely prefer giving the camera the control and using automatic area autofocus. And you think, holy, all you spent the beginning of this telling me was don't do anything auto. But the auto area AF works really well. And I'm gonna show you now what it looks like in the viewfinder. And essentially what it does is draws boxes around the subject that it's trying to rack focus on. So this is a rough-legged hawk who's trying to hunt. He evidently saw something on the ground, dove down off the post, went straight down. And what I'm seeing in my viewfinder is it drawing the little boxes around the subject. And what impressed me most about it is he's actually a pretty similar tonality to the background. Like his plumage is designed to allow him to blend into the environment which he's in. And it picked him out no problem at all. And this is with the, uh, this would be a 200 to 500 again using the F to Z adapter on, I believe, a, this is a Z7. I'm almost totally sure this is a Z7. Now I have a six-year-old and a one-year-old, so it's not all about the animals. I have my own little animals. This is the six-year-old. His name's Ethan. Um, get him on a scooter. He's a rocket ship, and it's the way it works. So even in this case, I'm using automatic area autofocus. And just said, Ethan, come to me. And he knows I'm doing autofocus tests and stuff, and he's so patient, I'll give that to him. Sometimes he just cold refuses, stops, and says, no, Dad. <laughs> but basically, here's what I'm seeing in my viewfinder as he's getting closer and closer. He's drawing the boxes over him, and as he takes up more and more of the frame, it adds more and more boxes. Oh, and it skips right through to the next guy. No, we'll stop there. Yeah, see how patient he is with my constant, hey man, just go down that way again. Come back to me again. Okay, go down that way again. What are you doing? Different autofocus mode. Come back. I'm tired. <laughs> okay, fine. Last one, I promise. This was the last one. He was out of patience. <laughs> God love him. All right. So this, this is the Z50. Um, so this little guy. Um, I was fortunate enough to have my hands on one a little while ago. Um, not far from my house is this place called the George C. Rifle Migratory Bird Sanctuary, and it is one of the most biodiverse places that you can visit anywhere in Canada. At different times of the year, there can be upwards of three to 400 different species of bird at this sanctuary. Um, we have a family pass. I take my little guy all the time. He always grabs a P1000 or a D7500. I give him a zoom lens, and he mostly takes pictures of duck butts, as he calls it. <laughs> He'll walk up to the duck, it'll walk away, and he'll take a picture of it. And I'm fine with that. He loves photography. But so this is a, this is a Z50 with the F to Z adapter with a two times teleconverter with the 300 millimeter PF. So when we take the two times into account, we're at 600 millimeter F8. It's a DX sensor, so we add another 1.5 times crop to that. We're out to 900 millimeter F8. And this grabbed focus so well. Again, this is using the automatic area autofocus and it just draws the boxes, and he's right up at the edge of the frame because at 900 mil, I don't care how steady you are, a slight movement moves your subject a long way in the frame. So the fact that this camera was just racking autofocus like that at F8 at 900 millimeter, for me, I was just like, oh, I can't wait. Of course, I did. I went ahead and bought a Z6. 
All right, so a little bit of a pro sports example, and I want to I want to carefully qualify this one. So this one I'm using an Atomos recorder on top of the, at the time it was the Z7. And I'm basically showing you what the viewfinder is seeing as I'm shooting a Whitecaps game. So let's play the video. So even with the background in the crowd, and then as soon as Kendall Watson comes into frame, face detection, boom, it grabs him. Now these little pauses or the Atomist recorder at the time not being able to handle me taking still frames while it was trying to record the screen of the camera. But this is up at ISO 8000, and absolute, I was just like, oh, this is with the 500 millimeter PF. And again, this is one of those situations where I caught myself watching the game more than shooting the game. And I was like, oh yeah, I was supposed to get some of these examples, so I made sure eventually that I did. But the one overriding theme to everything I've told you about autofocus so far, and this is a rule that I absolutely live by and I would love each and every one of you to adopt it for whatever kind of shooting that you do. Repeat after me, always be in AFC. Your turn. Always be in AFC. Awesome. Okay. If you... Always be, a, yeah, TFC. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Okay, and there's a follow-up to always be in AFC. Why always be in AFC? I'm gonna ask for a show of hands here. Who in the room are my back button focusers? All right, we got a few of you. The rest of you need to learn it, use it, and love it. And if you use back button focus in combination with AFC, you get the best of both worlds. You get continuous autofocus and single point autofocus. And the reason I say that is this. We're in continuous autofocus right now, and I'm racking focus on that kind gentleman right there. And the second I release the AF on button, I've literally locked the focus just like I would have in AFS. And I want to start focusing again, I press the AF on button. And now I'm doing continuous autofocus again, and he settles into position, and I release that button, I'm in AFS mode again. It gives you the best of both worlds. Sorry, you are, like, uh, I don't use the shutter button at all, okay. just the AF on button on the back. I am a firm believer that the shutter button was designed for one purpose. In the olden days, the shutter button made an exposure. Uh, with the advent of digital photography and more and more advanced autofocus systems, this actually became a button that added autofocus as a function. Not one camera you will ever see me holding will have autofocus assigned to the shutter button at all. I am a 100% back button focuser. I am 100% in AFC mode because it gives me the best of both worlds. So if you're not using it yet, please try it. If your camera does not have a dedicated AF on button, like right now the Z50 has, doesn't have the AF on button, I go through the menu and the first thing I do is assign it to that. And I disconnect autofocus completely from my shutter button because I firmly believe that the shutter was designed to make an exposure and that's it. Always be in AFC. I won't make you say it again. All right, drive mode. For action subjects, you want a fast camera. You want something that can rip a whole bunch of frames. Uh, we're not shooting 36 frames of film anymore. You're not changing film rolls. You're shooting to a 128 gigabyte card. I have a 128 gig card in the, in the Z50 right now and that's 2,700 RAW files. And really, it's just a bit of time going through them. It's not costing me any money. It's not costing me anything except time. Um, so you genuinely, you probably want a fast DSLR. Um, D7500, as a for instance, shoots eight frames a second. The Z6 shoots nine frames a second. The new Z50 is 11 frames a second. The Z6 is 12 frames a second. The Z7 is nine frames a second. The D5 is 12 frames a second. The D500 is 10 frames a second. We have a bunch of really, really fast cameras. And if you're gonna be shooting any kind of action-oriented subject, my advice to you is take as many frames as you can. Uh, if you're shooting a bird in flight, you shoot three frames, that fourth frame might have represented that perfect wing beat that you were looking for. Um, or in my case, the short-eared owl ripping the head off the top of the vole. Like, that might have been frame seven. And I would have been really mad if I'd have just shot one. So I always say set your camera up for the maximum shutter speed that you can when you're shooting an action subject and just go for it. All it's gonna cost you later on is a little bit of time going through those frames. Now, saying that, I have about 24 terabytes of storage on my desktop from a whole bunch of frames that I've never even looked at. Um, but I firmly believe that keeping each one of those frames, because the misses teach me more than the hits. 
For every successful frame you've seen in this presentation, there are a thousand that I absolutely blew. And I'm okay with admitting that. Um, it's perfectly okay. So yeah, as fast as you possibly can. DX versus FX, the merits of each. All right, so DX gives you reach, FX gives you low light capability. That, that, that math has kind of changed over the last little while as the, as the sensors have gotten more sensitive, they've gotten better at high ISO, they're able to do so much more than they used to be able to do. Um, I oftentimes shoot a D3500 up at ISO 10,000 because it'll do it and it'll make a nice looking file. Um, Z6, Z7, I take them way high as you'll see a little bit later. But one of the big things with action subjects when we're talking about DX versus FX is actually the sensor size and the amount of effective pixels that you're putting on your subject. So let's just do a little bit of numbers. I'm going to get into some math for which I apologize, but we have to do this. So the FX sensor size is 24 by 36 millimeters. That's sort of your standard 35 millimeter full frame sensor size. When we talk about a DX sensor size, well, it gets a little bit smaller. It's 16 by 24, so one and a half times crop. So let's talk about specific camera models and what does that actually mean when we're photographing, <laughs> say, a flying subject like an eagle? So with a D750 or a Z6, approximately a 24 megapixel image capture, and that's what you get. And it's a nice looking bird up in the sky, and that's, that's, that's happy times. We're happy with that. If we wanted to take that image though and crop it and to get, to get a closer on view of that distant subject, so we can totally do that with a, a D750 or a Z6. So if we do a DX equivalent crop, as you can see, we threw away 14 megapixels of data to get the same effective field of view. Now, if I was to take, say, a D7500, a D500, or the new Z50, they share equivalent resolution in terms of sensor. Okay, so the same 750 mil equivalent though, but we're putting almost 21 megapixels to get the same effective field of view. Is that me telling you that DX is better than FX? No. That's me telling you that sometimes for specific situations like this where your subject might be more distant, a DX camera might be a better option because it's actually putting more physical pictures, more data on your subject as opposed to taking that big file and cropping it down. Now, one qualifier I should put into this. If we took that D750 and Z6 and made it a D850 slash Z7, Effectively, by the time you did that crop, you end up with about the same effective resolution, about 21 megapixels DX crop from a D850 or a Z7. So essentially, there's almost no difference. But if it's a lower megapixel, you're throwing a lot of data away to get that equivalent crop. So just be aware of that. That's not me trying to sway you one way or another. Now, lens technology. Who are my DSLR shooters in the room? That's a bunch of hands. All right, who are my mirrorless shooters in the room? You're about to be. Yes, yes awesome. Okay, so for those of you that shoot DSLR, I mean your, your paradigm of vibration reduction is lens-based VR. And it's absolutely fantastic. I'll show you a couple examples in a minute here. Um, even on the new Z50, the, the VR will be lens-based. There's no in-body image stabilization on the Z50, so the VR is actually based around the lens. These are the two new lenses. What is VR? What does it do? Well, this is what VR does. There's that. But VR will allow you to do that. How nice. <coughs> basically, you're short on light, you're short on shutter speed, and the lens basically cancels out any vibration you might introduce. Me, heavily caffeinated in the morning, I rely a lot on both VR or in-body image stabilization. Now an example of how well can VR work on a DSLR, this is an example. This is a D850, the 200 to 500, racked out to 500. I'm all the way up at ISO 9000 and my shutter speed was only 1 50th of a second. There was literally no light when I took this picture. But that guy was a long way out and he looked like he was coming in and I waited for him and he came in. And that's me using every little bit of the four and a half stops that the 200 to 500 is rated for. To shoot this shot at 150 is racked out. I'm not on a tripod. I am handheld standing there waiting on this short-eared owl to do something. Eventually he did nothing. I took this shot and was quite happy to get it and walked away. Now, if you're in mirrorless land, oh, let's go back a bit. So five stops of built-in VR using native glass. Um, so it's five axes, five stops. 
which is great, which basically means the 24 to 70 f4, the so to speak kit lens that comes with the Z6 and Z7, I can take that lens at 24 millimeter, hand hold it at one second, pin sharp, no problem at all. It is absolutely incredible. Um, so it's pitch and yaw, rotational, translational. It corrects for almost everything. It can even correct for me having like a quadruple latte. It can do it. <laughs> and okay, so here's some. So that same Cormorant helicopter that we talked about before. Uh, this is shot actually using a, an F-mount lens. So I'm actually using the benefits of both. I'm using the in-body image stabilization helping the VR on the lens. So it's adding an extra axis at five stops. And one of the things when you're shooting propeller type aircraft or helicopters to try to do is to try to get that full disc out of the propeller or the rotor. So this is the 180 to 400 with the 1.4 times teleconverter engaged. So I'm at an effective focal length of 560 millimeters. This is handheld and that's at 1 15th of a second. And that's using every bit of the stabilization that both the camera and the body could offer me to actually get the full disc of the rotor and the full disc of the tail rotor. I like doing that. Now, this frame, one of the most frustrating frames I've ever tried to get in my life. This took 32 pictures to actually get this picture. Um, so the snow started falling and I could see in my EVF, I could see the strokes of snow because my shutter speed was way down. And so I want it, I'm at 500 millimeter. I have the 500 PF on my camera. I'm shooting the carbon <laughs> picture style. So I want to get these streaks of snow but what I'm waiting for is these two guys to stand still enough for me to actually get a sharp picture of these two guys. So I sat there, and I'd take a frame, and I'd look at it, and I'd go, okay, yeah, he moved. All right, okay, take another shot. Okay, he moved. Okay, this shot I absolutely blew because I jiggled everything too far. So 32 frames later, I looked down, did the fist pump because I nailed it, and I walked away because I knew I wasn't going to repeat it, but really, really happy with that frame. A DC-3 going to run me over. No, that rope is in the way. But this is the 85 millimeter 1.8 S series lens on a Z7, and that's at a third of a second handheld. Um, I'm letting the body do everything for me. And when you really get in on this file, you can see literally every rivet on the plane's body. Uh, really, really nice, sharp result. And that's allowing the in-body image stabilization to do its job as I want it to do, as I have this mighty loud plane coming right towards me. Uh, but that's all right. So, all this stuff, all the technology, the lenses, of the bodies, it's all great, but it matters for nothing if you don't set yourself up correctly to get a shot. Now, I totally stole this, Doug Rip, from our godfather ambassador, Mr. Joe McNally. I took a workshop from Joe, it's gotta be going on, it's a lot of years ago now. And the first thing he noticed, and he, he's an honest spoken guy, he doesn't hide things. And he's like, what are you doing shooting right-eyed? Like, so who's a right-eyed shooter in the room? Jacob throws up his hand. Okay, so he switched me to left eye that day, and I haven't shot right-eyed since. And there's a really, really simple reason for it. And it's all about body ergonomics and how I set myself up to shoot. And it allows me to get those really, really long shutter speeds without worrying about... So here we go. Let's get into this. So the first thing I do is I'm like feet shoulder width apart, let knees slightly bent. And when you think about it, if I shoot right eyed, so I got to put the camera out over here and I kind of came my head over and now I'm looking and I'm looking out there. I'm at a 20th of a second at 400 millimeter five, six, because I had a two times on it. I can't hold that steady enough. But if you look, my bicep is like full tension right now trying to hold this rig up because this is like, like two times an old 70 to 200. Like this is not the lightest thing ever. Now, that's because I'm shooting right eyed. I'm pointing at Jacob right now. Yeah, he's looking at me. He's looking right at me. Okay, now, same stance, everything, but I make the change to left eye, and watch what happens. Now, my ribs are taking all the weight. I'm straight up and down. My bicep is squishy again. It's not working. My bicep's squishy most of the time, but <laughs> it's squishy again. And I'm, I'm not actually bearing any weight from this combo at all. So if I'm shooting a really, really long lens, like a 500 or a 600, Doing this and waiting for my subject to do something, I'm a shaky mess because my arm is just under tension and it sucks after a while. If I do this, I can literally sit there for minutes at a time waiting for something, waiting for my subject to do what I want my subject to do. And it's all about 
my elbows dug into my ribs, I'm not actually supporting any weight now at all. And as soon as I made that change from right eye to left eye, you would see that one third of a second, that one eighth of a second, the one fifteenth of a second at these really, really long focal lengths became possible where it wasn't possible before. I was doing this at a photo club in the North Shore and one of my MPS guys got these shots of me doing it. It's a 500 F4. That was like the most fun month I had when I had that lens. Anyways, yeah. All right. Where I'm going to give the nod back to mirrorless and I'm actually going to pick this combo right back up. Uh, the one thing I absolutely adore about mirrorless cameras is the ability to use teleconverters with almost any lens in my arsenal. All right, so let's go. Teleconverters. Yes, yes, yes. So this is three great horned outlets, Larry, Curly, and Mo. Um, they were in a little area not far from my house, um, poking out of their little owl hole. And so this is with a 500 PF with a two times teleconverter on it on a Z6. So I'm an effective focal length of 1,000 millimeters, F11. And the cool thing about it was the autofocus was... Now on an SLR, if you ask the DSLR to focus at F11, you're asking a lot because the light's got to bounce down to a separated autofocus sensor and it's going to kind of try to find the contrast and it's going to do an okay job. But the mirrorless cameras are unreal for using teleconverters. So Larry Curley and Mo were, were very cooperative subjects. Uh, their mom just sat there and slept all day. Or a Red Wing Blackbird. And this is the same combo, 200 to 500 with a two times teleconverter on a Z7. And it's sharp, there's nice separation to the background. Um, the nice thing is, I don't have the variability, like it, the, the autofocus is right on sensor. So when it says it's in focus, it's in focus. And there's no big wobbles that you would get out of a contrast detect system at F11. It goes in, it locks in, it grabs focus. This one's getting a little more extreme. So this is the uh, Z50 with the 200 to 500 with a two times teleconverter on it. So my effective focal length is 1500 millimeters F11. Um, that bald eagle is a long way away. And look at the size of the talons on that thing. Yeah, you don't want him coming after you. You just don't. You saw this image before, but this was also shot with a teleconverter. Um, so her two chicks were in her nest sleeping. Uh, we have a rookery not far from my house, and there's about 30 different Anna's hummingbird nests in about 40 feet of space. They're all over the place. And so I'm standing with the 500-5.6 and an F to Z adapter. And I'm taking pictures of her sleeping babies and I can hear this kind of hum and chirp above me and it's mom and she wouldn't go in and feed her kids because I was too close. So and I don't know too many other people that would say this but I had a two times teleconverter in my pocket. So I took it off and I'll put the 500 back on, step back for the same framing, the same composition and that gave her the confidence that I was far enough away to go in, feed her babies and voila, we got the shot. And the cool thing about this, this is at 12,800 ISO on a 46 megapixel sensor. Because obviously I went to F11, so I doubled my effective ISO. It wasn't that bright out. But I got a, like a really cool shot of a mama and his hummingbird feeding her little ones. Kind of fun. Back to the Z50. That's the Z50 with the 300 millimeter PF, so an effective 900 millimeter F8. And like the lightest 900 millimeter F8 you could ever find. Such a, a pleasure to handhold. Same thing, 900 millimeter F8, another Anna's Hummingbird, just stopping for a quick snack. Or for really, really big fun, point it at the moon, 1500 millimeter F11, because why not? Because I could, wanted to play. Yeah, so that's all fun and good. We have our teleconverters covered, we have autofocus covered, we have autofocus modes covered, drive mode covered, exposure mode covered. We've talked about a whole bunch. The best feature we've ever given you is auto ISO. Uh, does anybody use it? I see some nodding heads. Yeah, I, I love auto ISO simply for the fact that I still get creative control over what's happening with my camera and lens combination, but my camera almost guarantees me a perfect exposure every time. The metering sensors are so sophisticated now. If you're in matrix metering, they do a great job of seeing the scene. And the cool thing is that you can use the exposure compensation to bring up and down your ISO without affecting your creative control. Now what's kind of fun with this is if you set your minimum shutter speed to auto and you're shooting a 500 millimeter lens, your camera's smart enough to know it's a 500 mil lens, so it's generally going to try to limit, limit your low shutter speed to about 1 500th of a second or 1 over focal length. Um, 
You can also set your minimum shutter speed, say if you're shooting really fast moving little birds, you can set your minimum shutter speed to 1 hundredth of a second and the camera will try not to allow you to go below that so you can get a nice sharp shot of that bird in flight. So auto ISO I absolutely adore. So what's the best body to use? Well, the best body to use is the one you own. We want you to buy new stuff, of course we do, we're Nikon, we love you, we love that you love our gear, but oftentimes I find that uh, a lot of people use 10% of what their cameras can do. Um, I remember when I first joined Nikon, I got my first box of sample gear, and I was so excited because when I opened it, the first thing that was there was a D5. I was like, yes! <laughs> right under the D5 was a D3500. And I was like, okay, that's, or D3400. I'm like, okay, that's cool, but man, I got a D5, look, it's awesome! So I phoned our national tech guy, and I'm like, dude, thanks for the D5. He's like, yeah, you don't have a card. Learn how to use the 3400, then I'll send you a card. <sighs> so I stared at this D5 box for weeks while I like really dug into what the 3400 could do. And I got a really solid appreciation for that little camera. And then when I finally proved that I kind of really took some time to learn the D3400, I begged and pleaded, and I got the card, and then I went and shot the D5 a whole bunch. So yes. That might be the best body to use, but that might not be the best body for your pocketbook. It's an $8,500 camera body. We don't all have that. Um, I don't know, in the mirrorless series, nobody's used a Z50 in the room yet except a few of us. Um, for me, that's one of the best bodies we make right now. Uh, like I've, I shot a little bit a couple weeks ago, and I've had my sample now for four days, and I've fallen in love with this little camera already. Like, it's so cute, but it, like, it's a, it's a D500 in there. Like, it, the sensor's a D500, and it's all the awesome mirrorless stuff that we talked about, and it's this tiny little camera, and oh yeah, I'm a giant fan. Now, saying that, I just invested my own bucks in one of these, and I think it's sitting out back for me to pick up. I'm going to get that tomorrow. And I got it with an F to Z adapter, and I'm gonna, I have 46 old manual Nikkor lenses at home that I would never shoot on an SLR because I had no focus aid, and with these I have focus peaking. So I'm going to use all my old manual lenses now, again, with my new mirrorless camera. I'm so excited. Okay, so the best body is whatever you have, but one of the things I think is really important is to learn the outer limits of your gear. And I think we're all really guilty of reading the internet and going, you shouldn't take your D500 above ISO 3200 because there's too much grain. <laughs> I shake my head in your general direction. All right, let's have a look. This is a D5 at 45,600 ISO, because I can. There's not too many other bodies I can take that far. But it was me and the chief inspector of the Delta Police Department standing beside each other one night waiting for this guy to take flight. We're both using auto ISO. And we're sitting there, we both agreed 1 1600th because of the type of owl that it is, you want to get a nice sharp wing tip. And we're watching our auto ISO value climb up and up and up. And I looked at him and said, when this hits 51.2, I'm out of here. He's like, yeah, me too, I'm not going higher than that. He made a sound and he took flight and we both sat there and blasted off this big thing of, as he was flying around. We were both really happy. At 45,600 ISO, I have a 24 by 36 of this printed and it is an absolutely gorgeous print. <laughs> Yes, there is some grain in there. It's a 45,000 45, ISO shot, but don't let that fool you. Learn the outer limits of your gear. Here's a D500 at 10,000 ISO. I didn't lose any detail in the plumage of that bar now. He's still flying. My shutter speed is not quite where I'd like it, but it was pretty dark out. That's with the 200 to 500, 5, 6. That was all I was getting. I capped my auto ISO on D500 at 12,800. I'm very comfortable to go there, and I was exploring the upper limits of it. Now, get a little bit faster lens, equivalent settings, a little more subject isolation, and you get that. Northern Harrier, just waiting on his meal. Same effective ISO, but you can see how the bokeh kind of just really helped out with the overall frame. It's a really nice, sharp shot. Looks better on that screen, actually. But you can see my shutter speed now, it's a 1 32,000th, because that's what I like for smaller raptors to really freeze their wings. Um, that's about the right shutter speed for that. A D5 at 12,800 ISO isn't even beginning to break a sweat. That's like me walking slowly in front of you guys. It's just strolling along doing this little D5 thing. That's nothing. You can see all the mosquitoes around them, they were chewing on me too. Yeah. Again, 45,600 on a D5, that was the very beginning of that flight. How about a D500 at ISO 6400? 
I'm not ashamed to admit that this is the last time I saw this guy in my viewfinder. The combo I was shooting at the time was a D500 with a two times teleconverter with a 400 millimeter 2.8. So I was an effective 1200.56. And the second he left my viewfinder, I couldn't find him again. That's a Merlin, they're really, really, really fast. So once he was gone, he was gone. I was not seeing him again. But let's get into some new stuff. So how about the Z7, a long-eared owl at ISO 14,400. And in case you're wondering, 14,400 at 100% still looks really darn good. Yes, there is some noise there, but every little detail in his plumage is absolutely fine. And I'm pushing that camera. I'm not pushing it super hard, but I'm pushing it. Let's talk about a big push. How about 25,600 ISO on a Z6? That camera is not even starting to sweat at 25,000 ISO. It is a low light monster. I love that camera. Well, that's again, let's get in there at 100% just to so every little piece of plumage. This is a Northern Flicker. They have the most annoying call in the bird kingdom. You hear them from forever away and you know they're around. You can go get a picture of them. Again, the D850, that's at ISO 9000 and you probably didn't get to see it super up close before. Oh, let's go back, sorry. Let's let you see it up, 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 up close. That's what a D850 looks like at ISO 9000. And this is a lot higher than you would probably be thinking before you walked into this room this night. But my job is not to go do what the gear will do. My job is to go find out what the gear can do. And I'm constantly doing that. I'm pushing this stuff to the, to the edge of what I think it's capable of and sometimes even beyond because I want to know where the outer limit is. And I haven't found too many situations where I can't go out and get a shot. Especially if I'm hiking this far to go get a shot. I'm not leaving without making pixels. Like that's just, it's a waste of time. Now, yeah, that's underexposed. That's underexposed badly. That's a grizzly bear. He's having a bath. There's mosquitoes everywhere. I'm showing you basically uh, what I look like in Lightroom. So let's play with this file. Let's do some stuff. So what I did is I did a two and three quarter stop straight exposure pull. I yanked the shadows up to plus 80 and I grabbed some vibrance just to put some color back in the frame. And you would think, okay, that's equivalent to about a four stop pull. I mean, that's not being very nice to a file. Uh, so let's look at it at 100%. Lots of detail, there is a little mosquito. You can even see the little mosquito wings. Mm -hmm. If you look up in the top left hand corner, what kind of file is that? That wasn't even a raw file. Oh I did that to a JPEG. Now, this is before we had the raw developer for the D850, so this was me going, okay, what can I do with these files? And I did this to it, went, oh my God, okay, this is gonna be awesome. Now, I totally blew the exposure, I must admit, like that was my bad, I didn't expose that correctly, but learning what I could do with a four stop pull to a JPEG on that sensor, then I found out that the similar resolution, similar type of sensor was gonna be in the Z7, and I was like, oh my God, this is gonna be so much fun. So. We took a little boat cruise this summer, and this is just outside New Westminster. Uh, we're on a paddle wheeler on the Fraser River, and that's the Patolo Bridge, which I'm always scared about going under because it's falling down. But a beautiful sunset, really nice sunset, but literally no foreground detail at all. So I did the same thing. Now this is in camera. I didn't even put this through Lightroom. I did an in-camera shadow pull. And so there's lots of detail in there. I preserved the sunset, and of course the next thing I wanted to know is what did I do to those trees in the background? Did I destroy them? No, no, everything looks absolutely fine. It's pretty pixelated because I've zoomed right in uh, just for purposes of this, but there is no issues with any of the shadows at all. And I did this in camera. This didn't go near any external processing at all. The only thing I did was grab it in the keynote presentation and drag it really big so you could see it. Yeah, so Z7, awesome. So let's get there, Z series. Um, we have one of these outside. It's not coming soon anymore. It's right out there, the 58.95. I'm a giant big fan. Um, every other one of these lenses I photographed and I've compared them to their Z mount contemporary or their F mount contemporary if there is one. And every one of these lenses, especially the 5018 and the 8518 have become like my absolute favorites. I am not normally a 2470 guy, but the 24 to 70 F4 kit lens, which is way better than any kit lens ever, is an amazing little walk around. The 2470 2.8 is crazy. The 14 to 30 takes screw in filters. I have a 10 stop 82 mil screw in filter that I can use now. I bought it all these years ago. What am I going to do with this thing? And then Nikon, listen, they made a lens that I can use it for. So I didn't waste the 300 bucks. That's a really, really fun lens. Um, but we made these lenses because 
we made a new mount. Um, those of you that shoot SLR know the F mount. 60 years we've had that around. This one's new and it's awesome. It allows us to take light and fire it straight through the lens, straight onto sensor. And that means corner to corner sharpness. That means almost no chromatic aberration whatsoever. That means that each of these, unfortunately people think a 518, well it's a 518. No, not the Z518. It's a crazy awesome 518. Um, that just means each of these new Z lenses can be sharp, can be crazy fast focusing, can be really good wide open corner to corner. They're amazing lenses. But not everybody wants to invest in an entirely new lens system. So when we launched these, we launched the F to Z adapter. So that allows you to take F mount glass and adapt it and shoot it on Z mount bodies. I bought a Z6 to shoot my old manual Nikkor lenses. Why not? I wouldn't shoot them on an SLR because I can never be guaranteed I was racking focus. With focus peaking, on the new Z series, I can actually see in the frame what's in focus. It's a tube, there's no optics in there. It's just a spacer with electronic connections to allow the F mount to match to the Z. And if you're shooting a non VR F mount lens, the Z body, the six or the seven, adds VR to your lens in body. So it makes my 1424 an image stabilized lens. It makes my 105, 14 a VR lens. Like that would be a lens that I would never shoot slower than one two hundredth of a second because it's so unforgiving. I shoot it at 25th of a second now and I don't even think about it. Now, this is what we all wish we had at home. <laughs> like wouldn't that be an awesome gear table? Just like, I'm going shooting today. I want you, I want you, and I want you. And you take it and you go shoot. That would be absolutely amazing. Now, if any of you have this gear table, we'll exchange numbers, we'll be best buds, I promise, everything will be fine. If you don't have this gear table, you have something to aspire to, but yeah, this is pretty incredible. So what you're seeing there is a representation of every single AFS lens that is fully, completely auto exposure, auto focus compatible with the Z series today. And probably everyone in this room, because a lot of you put up your hands as DSLR shooters, own many of these lenses. All you need is that little guy right there, and you can use those on the new things including the new little Z50. But we have glass coming for everybody. So everything on this list with a blue dot, we've already released. So we have a 24 weight, 35 one 8, 50 one 8, 85, the 58.95 still to come. Uh, there's a 51 two apparently coming next year, a 21 eight, a couple of compact primes. I hope these are little pancakes. Don't know for sure, but the 28, I'm a 28 guy. I love 28 millimeter. It's like my favorite focal length ever. So I'm really excited for this guy. A 40, a 60 micro, an S line, which is our upper end Z series lens, an S line 105 micro, but that's just half of it. I'm gonna go to the bottom half now. Look at all this other stuff. So a 1424, the 70 to 200 F2.8, which apparently we said is coming sometime before the end of this year. Man, I hope so. I can't wait. Um, an S line 24 to 105, an S line 100 to 400. For those of you wondering about telephoto glass for the Z series, there is telephoto coming all the way out to 600 millimeter. A nice general purpose travel lens at 24 to 200, and then a DX 18 to 140. So that basically at the end of 2021 should have us at 23 native lenses on top of the 93 F mount lenses on top of the other 363 lenses that can be mounted with compatibility. It's a lot of lenses. We're okay. We're doing fine. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's dive through. I'm, I'm going to show you a series of some images and every one of these was shot with a Z body and either <laughs> Z glass or F mount glass. And I'll try to remember which because my presenter's notes are not showing up. So this is going to be a test of my memory banks. All right, that's definitely a Z6 and a 400 2.8. I remember that image. That's this year's Abbotsford International Air Show. And just be reminded, every one of these frames that you're going to see did not go near Lightroom or Photoshop. This was direct conversion out of camera, airdropped to my Mac, dropped into this presentation for you guys tonight. Northern Harrier swooping around down at Boundary Bay in nice evening light. Uh, that'll be 200 to 500, no teleconverter. Bighorn Sheep, that's the 500 PF and a Z6. Oh yeah, okay, this is Z50 4K video with a 300 millimeter PF and a two times teleconverter. So you're going to see a little, a little shaky, but I'm at 900 millimeters, so that can be excused. But I shot some 4K vids of this heron fishing. If you could hear the audio, you'd hear me coughing and trying to hold it still while I get this guy fishing. But that's uh, 4K30, 4K24 
on the Z50. Swallow your meal. There you go. Yeah. 180 to 400 with the 1.4 teleconverter engaged with a Z6. So that's Hamza. He's the, he's the pilot of the Canadian CF-18 Hornet demo team. Bard Owl in Victoria, British Columbia, a 300 millimeter PF on a Z7 with the F to Z adapter. Different Harrier, same area. Uh, that is 200 to 500. That is 300 PF on a Z6. Little Anna's Hummingbird having a meal. The American Forces Thunderbirds. They were at the Abbotsford Air Show this year. Full afterburner. That's an 800.56 on a Z7. Another different Mama Anna's Hummingbird feeding her baby. That is 300 PF on a Z6. All right, this is my little guy. This is Henry. Uh, he's my favorite action subject. You want to ever want to try to focus on a baby that just learned how to walk? I detect autofocus is magic for this. So we gave him a popsicle. He'd never had a popsicle before, and we just handed it to him and said, go to it, kid. And with this, I shall finish tonight. But have a look. These are the five faces of Henry versus the popsicle. <laughs> it's a good. Oh, I like it. Brain freeze! <laughs> And that concludes tonight's presentation. <laughs>